Welcome to the System to Success show. On this show, we'll cover the best growth advice from top CEOs in North America and beyond. On each episode, your host, Jay Crutchfield, he's a former software engineer turned entrepreneur, created and maintained online marketing, online sales, and fulfillment systems for global brands. He offers non-traditional wisdom about business systems mastery, while his guests share the story of how they built their companies. Jay and his guests talk entrepreneurship, digital marketing, strategy, and business principles. But they also talk about what it means to be human with all the ups and downs, advances, and setbacks. And what he does is he takes his information and strategies that has helped catapult global brands and brings that to the small business owner to give them the advantage. Make sure to subscribe and follow for more of these business system mastery principles. Today we have a very special guest in the house, Miss Carla Rieger. Uh, she's an awesome young lady. She's a CEO, speaker, trainer coach, facilitator, and author. Carla helps people communicate effectively both one-on-one -on -one as well as in groups. She helps them break through the resistance of change because, you know, sometimes change can be difficult just by opening up their minds to more positive things and positive change. She's spoken to over 1,500 groups internationally of up to 4,000 people. And today she's going to talk to us about how to craft your signature story that goes viral. So we're so excited to talk to Carla today. And again, I'm your host, Jay Crutchfield, and we're going to go deep into storytelling today. So without any further ado, let's welcome Carla to the stage. Welcome, Carla. Thanks, Jay. Happy to be here. It's excited. <laughs> And I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited that you are on the show today. I know you have some great jewels and nuggets just to share with the audience. So, yes, I'm ready to get started. Y'all ready? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. So, so Carla, can you share just a, a little bit more about your background so the audience can get to know you a little bit better? Sure. Yeah, I started out in university. I got asked to do speaking and I was really shy. I was a massive introvert and I said, no way, not a million years. I wouldn't do that. But uh, I kept getting asked to do these leadership programs and so I you know I took some acting courses because I thought that would help and uh, and then they trained me and I started going out and doing large group icebreaker events for students in campuses all over North America and I was really bad at first you know I was so shy I was so uh, terror stricken by it but because you know, they booked me for all of these events, like one day after another in all these different cities. I sort of had to get good fast. I had to figure out what the audience wanted and not care so much about, you know, how am I doing, right? I just, you know, by the end, I realized that was my biggest journey was going from, oh my God, you know, what are they going to think about me to how can I make their lives better? <laughs> And then everything changed, right? I don't know if you, know, you or you who are listening have noticed that. As soon as I made that shift, like, I'm just here to help you. And then the weird public speaking stuff went away. And I thought, and all these people came up and said, what you did made a big difference for me. And so I thought, wow, this is great. Like, make a difference for a lot of people all at the same time. So I worked for this company for a few years. And I started my own company. And I... Uh, then I started speaking at conferences and leadership retreats and doing staff trainings. I've been doing that ever since. And then people started asking me, how do I do what you do? And so I started coaching people to get out on the speed circuit and you know, do TED Talks or whatever it is what was going on for them. So I've just been pretty much doing that my whole adult life. Wow. So you started off at the university and you, you said you started – doing speaking and and then you you uh, you mentioned something that I know all speakers can relate to is the focusing on themselves like how do I look when I'm saying this or am I delivering this right <laughs> <I know. laughs> and so yeah so I know all speakers can relate to that and so how how did you start to make the shift Carla to thinking about okay 
let me get my eyes off of myself and see how can I really help uh, these people that I'm speaking into their lives? Well, it was a bit harsh, actually, because they called the company that had hired me and they said, please don't send that uh, girl back here next year. She was way too self-conscious. Mm. And so the man who was running the company said, the reason you come across as self-conscious is because you're worried about what you people think of you. And so I would just focus on, you know, if you were one of those students on your first day on campus, you don't know anybody and you're really afraid. And, and by the end, they're going to have friends because you do these icebreaker, you know, interactive things with them and they're going to feel better like be one of those students and talk to you in the audience and help you <laughs> and so i remembered what it was like for me my first day on campus i went oh, okay and the minute i did that all the reviews went up like oh she was great that was wonderful we love her let's have her back next year it was sort of night and day <laughs> so mm. that's how i made the shift wow so he said you got some some tough love from the feet <laughs> that's <laughs> uh, right and, and so wow okay so you made you made the shift you said okay now it's time to speak to myself in the audience and so that that sounds like an easier place to, to communicate with because you know yourself and, and so looking at that you started to talk more to yourself in 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 your speeches and so how how did you get into really telling stories uh, during your talks? Yeah, well, I noticed I just spontaneously did that one day. I just said, you know, I remember my first day on campus and I felt really nervous and nobody was talking to me. And I spent the first six months feeling so lonely, going to class by myself, never meeting anybody, sitting in a class with a hundred other students. And and getting really like, I, I wanted to drop out because of that. And then somebody told me, you know, <laughs> force yourself to meet some people. And as soon as I met some people, I joined a, a, a team of people who wrote a, a, a newsletter for the Arts Society. And then I met some people and they had some friends and, and I didn't want to drop out anymore. I'd made up in my head that I wanted to drop out because, oh, I just, you know, university's not for me. But it was just because I was lonely and I wasn't connecting to people and nobody was doing anything to help. You know, you so I had to join, I had to force myself. And I was very shy and introverted. So I told that story just off the cuff one day and all these people came up and said, wow, your story really stood out for me. And now I see the importance of, you know, forcing myself to meet people. And, and so I went, ooh, people really listen to stories. <laughs> I should come up with some more. Right? So then I just started learning story structure and storytelling. And I totally noticed, and you probably know this too, Jay, that actually if you could hook up someone's brain and watch their brain waves when they're listening to a story as opposed to when they're just listening to a list of concepts, their whole brain lights up when it's a story because it's kind of like how we all communicate and learn from each other for like a million years, maybe before the printing press. So we're hardwired for stories as you probably know oh I, I was enjoying where you were going <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and so everyone goes i don't want to bore people i want to engage them well yes. boom stories and examples just flip people's brains on right away wow so you 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 got the feedback of how how effective you were and how impactful you were to the students when you started to to tell stories. So with that, when you started to do the reflection on your, your story telling during that time, um, how, did you, how did you start to structure your story so that you can have that same type of effect on uh, future audiences? Yeah, story structure is really good. So I remember the first time I told a story, I kind of started telling it and then 
And then, you know, you get lost in your own story. Well, I think it happened on a Wednesday or a Thursday. And then people start getting bored, right? Because <laughs> you have, and you're including all sorts of stuff in the story that people actually don't need in order to get the gem, the universal human value that's at the core of the story. So you have to, and most people, when something happens to them, they don't think through what was the core universal value that's going to be of interest to somebody else who's listening. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, some people go, oh, I'm a great storyteller because I tell stories around the dinner table and everybody laughs and seems enthralled. But it's very different <laughs> to do that than to speak to an audience because if you don't tell a story that is relevant to them in your topic, people will switch off. And so... I teach a whole of course, story structure on that, but I think the main thing is to, you have to find a conflict or a play. I, I, I teach a five-part story structure in which you set a platform, you tilt the platform, and then you talk about how you, as the hero of the story, get back to stability and then what it means. So there's basically you know five parts. You set the platform, you tilt the platform, <laughs> what are the consequences? How do you get back to stability and what does that mean? What does that mean for you and opening up the possibilities of what it means for the, the listener? Now, that sounds very conceptual. So, you know, usually <laughs> I like to use an example and the example I use is often the Wizard of Oz because people know the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> so very quickly, the Wizard of Oz starts with Dorothy in Kansas. It's black and white. She's bored. She doesn't have parents and the, nasty lady steals her dog but then what tilts the platform what changes her world <laughs> da, da, da. the tornado <laughs> right her whole world changes the tornado takes her way to the new land and then her then the rest of the story is is the consequences so that's part three of like how do i get home how do I get back to stability? So all her adventures that she goes on and then her getting back to stability is, oh, all I have to do is click my heels three times and say, there's no place like home. Boom, I'm home. And then the, what does this all mean is that at the end, she realizes that it's important for her to appreciate home and appreciate where she came from. So that's like a quick and dirty version of a story structure that's useful for people. Wow. So, so, you know, for that, that uh, young lady that may be at the table or, uh, or the young man at the table that thinks that if they tell a good story during dinner time, that they're a great storyteller, <laughs> you would venture to say, um, there's some, a difference between the dinner storyteller <laughs> and the speaker on the audience, the audience, the speaker on stage telling the story. Yeah. Awesome. It, it has to relate to your topic and if people and and people do that right mm -hmm. and it's okay i think to open a speech with oh this thing happened to me on the plane coming here you know you hear speakers do that but i think you also have to tie into your point and people sometimes forget to do that they go oh this cool thing happened to me i'm just going to tell the story and it's an interesting story but you didn't help bring your message home so, mm -hmm. so and it's hard sometimes to do that with yourself like what what was important to me about that experience mm. like what's useful in there for for you as a listener and usually it's some kind of value thing you know learning to believe in yourself or learning to be more courageous or learning to let go of the past or you know those deep soul lessons that we all have to go on those make the best stories Hmm. That's really good. I'm, I'm, I'm jotting down those uh, notes on those, you know, the five points for that story structure you spoke about setting it, uh, tilting, listing the consequences, bringing things back to stability, and then basically speaking on the meaning, which you spoke on just the value, the core value that um, basically your audience can relate to. Did, did I get those down, Carla? Okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, <laughs> awesome, awesome. So, so you spoke you spoke about um, also too on the on the story side, and I want to know like how do you how do you recover when a story does not go the way that you 
you think the audience will respond and you may feel like running off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, <clears throat> that happens, doesn't it? <laughs> well, the first thing you do is um, have compassion for yourself. <laughs> There's nothing worse than seeing someone kind of have that look on their face like, I just bombed and I'm so upset with myself for bombing. So I always go, I see that story didn't land with anybody. <laughs> That's okay. That's my responsibility. So, and then I kind of try to get back, especially if it's a funny story and clearly you meant it to be funny. And then there's like silence. <laughs> Nobody laughs or anything. <laughs> and, you know, so then you do what's called a saver line. Like, wow, oh, my mom thought that was funny. I ought to go back to the drawing board. Right? <laughs> and you just make fun of yourself having bombed. And then the whole audience is like, oh, good. You know, like, <laughs> she's okay with herself making mistakes. She's more hu human and humble and they like you more when you do that. So that's usually what I do and tell my coaching clients to do. Hmm. Uh, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, what you just pointed out is, um, if I'm understanding it correctly, is uh, you just mentioning how basically how becoming even more vulnerable during the moment allows you to connect uh, more with the audience. Okay. Yeah. Or anytime you sort of see the audience not get it or seem to go away is, you know, I could sometimes check in with the audience and go, how are we doing here? <laughs> what do people need? Or let's all take a stretch break or, or you just change things quickly or pause and, you know, regather the attention and it shows you're listening, right? And that you care that people get it. And you're not like, oh my God, they're not listening. Oh, those two people are talking to each other. I must be really bad. Somebody walked out of the room. I must suck as a speaker. <laughs> and the minute you do that, you go in your head and you see people, you see the look on their face. They're talking, they're out there. And then all of a sudden they're like, and you can see them go inside their head and, and start to shut down. And nobody wants to listen to a speaker who's shutting down like that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I just try to be open and kind of go it seems like people aren't getting this or we're missing something is, is can I just put it out to the group you know what do, do I need to explain something better back then and usually there's some <laughs> bold person will go yeah I don't really get what happened between this point and that point and you're like oh okay and then you solve it right there and then Gotcha. It, that's not always appropriate, but you know, if it's a smaller group, or it's a training environment sometimes and you have the time, it makes sense to do that. Okay. So yeah, making sure if, if it's appropriate, the size of the audience, just going back, asking questions to, to see where they are. Okay. Yeah. That yeah. Makes sense. Cool. So I'm, I'm interested because you spoke about when you, when you um, were first getting started and, um, or I, I would go all the way back to the days when you said when you started at university and you were shy. And so looking at that, what actually inspired you to become a professional speaker, even though you, you started off and had those feelings of shyness and almost uh, like a, introvertedness well that very thing I wanted to heal from that <laughs> I just thought I don't even want to you know ask a question in class right I don't I can't talk to more than one person I you know I, I would get the the neck rash which is <laughs> something in the Celtic background right? <laughs> you get these red Lots just all over your neck, it's very, and then everybody knows you're really embarrassed, oh. so it's, <laughs> you can't hide it. And so I thought, I need to deal with this. And so I was, <laughs> and so when asked, somebody asked me if I wanted to audition for this company and do speaking, and then they actually told me how much I would make, which was way more than I was making as a waitress. 
And that, that appealed to me too. And I thought that would be, and they're going to train me. I thought that's going to get me out of myself. And, and then I took acting courses at the same time. And I just, and as soon as I got skills and tools, I was fine. And you'd never know. People would never know I'm an introvert or that I was ever shy. Now, because I just learned how to make, <laughs> how to feel comfortable. And, you know, you just do it enough and you go, oh, I survive. I don't die here at the top front of the room. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know how the survival brain thinks if I go up there and I bomb, I will never be able to live with myself the rest of my life. That's the kind of thoughts people have that make them so afraid of public speaking. And then you realize you survive and you live, even if you don't do well, you're just like, oh, well. Life goes on. I can do this again, right? Yes, I survived. I'm I'm good. I can live another day. <laughs> wow. That's right. Wow. So I'm I'm curious to to see how how did your how did your acting courses um, help with just um with the with public speaking? Well, I guess they gave you techniques to kind of break out of yourself and and be um i think take on a persona that would be not to be inauthentic to yourself but that you could create a persona that was connected to your true self but that you know, because I think the shy persona was just a mask that I used to protect myself from having you know, really critical parents or whatever you want to, you know, wherever that came from. And so I, I learned to shut down, right? So that's just a mask. So I take off that mask, I put on another mask, and I'm the helper, right? I want the guide. I want to guide and help people. And so when I'm that persona, I don't have any of the weird stuff around speaking. <laughs> I'm just there to help. And I found that particularly useful and, and that you had to get up over and over again regularly in front of the room and feel the audience interaction, get used to it, you know, that one-to-one -one as opposed to one-on-many, it's a different game and then you'd walk and they give you all these techniques. So I don't know if that answers your question. But. Yes, yes, it does. It does. So it, it, it got you used to, um, you spoke about the, the repetition portion of, about you continuously getting up and then how it allowed you to amplify what was already inside of you and being yeah. able to express it um, more and to take off the mask, uh, you know, <laughs> die a persona and really let the, the real Carla come out uh, so that everybody <laughs> could see it. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I think we all want to help people. You know, most people are driven to make a difference even if, uh, you know, it's something very technical or, you know, but you want to help people. And, and so if you can tap into that natural drive that I think, you know, makes you want to get out of bed in the morning and <laughs> face the challenges of life. And if you don't know your why, if you don't know, you know, how you want to serve people or systems on the planet, then you can feel very, that's when the neur the neuroses can take over, right? <laughs> and like the shyness or, you know, everything, you know, we all have them, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. Good points. Good points. So I'm, I'm also curious about, I guess I'm curious about a lot of things, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but one thing I was, I was thinking about as, as we we're talking is about just the, um, just the widespread use of uh, social media and so how people are using it in all types of instances. And so how, how do you, how do you use uh, social media for your storytelling as a speaker? Yeah. Well, the thing that I find that I found really useful is, you know, most speakers, especially if they're a motivational or inspirational speaker, have a why, a why story, why I do what I do, why I speak on this topic. And I used to 
speak, and I still do, actually on fun in the workplace, marrying work and play. Mm. And that was, a, I would keynote, do keynotes and breakout sessions on that topic and how to make you know, teams more fun and engaging. And so, you know, one day this woman asked me, she was, oh, that was a really fun day. I loved it. She says, why, why do you do that? Like, why do you speak on that topic? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> You know, like nobody had ever asked me. I never I ever thought about it. And I thought, oh, well, I guess it's because I come from the overly serious family, right? And I'm being a rebel. And everything was just about work and getting a lot of stuff done.